Good evening. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship this weekend. One of the most amazing phrases in all of Scripture comes when Paul proclaims to one of the early churches, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Proclaiming that the power of death has been conquered, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and that we who follow Jesus are able to hold on to this in the face of anything that comes our way. That death is conquered, and thus we can look across the rest of our lives without fear. Right? We hold on to the faith that, as Paul puts it, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is to have the joy and to be fulfilling the purpose following Jesus, and to die is to gain the kingdom that is to come. Death is conquered, thus, not by permanently avoidance, not through a rat race of trying harder and harder every day to avoid it, but by acknowledging that when we face it, and each of us will, that we need not fear it, for there is something on the other side, following Jesus on a path that he has already paved. That is how we approach, that's our faith, how we approach death as people who follow Jesus. Now, the that does not mean that death is a good thing. It's not. Death, I mean, at best, is a peaceful moment. A pe person can proclaim their faith and die peacefully, and that's what I, I mean, obviously, that, that's what we prefer. Be surrounded by friends and family who can then celebrate a life well lived. And, and sometimes death is um, horrifying and shocking, and it can leave scars and burdens and... Uh, when I, we come to such situations, there is no easy answer because if something made sense, I mean, it's the, the lack of sense that makes something so evil, like a sudden death. And I don't think there's any quick answer, like God needed another angel or it had to be God's plan. I just don't buy it, right? I, I think that uh, sudden and shocking death is not God's plan. I think it is a situation where God weeps with us in the same way that Jesus wept with Lazarus' sisters when Lazarus died. Because death is such a challenge to understand and such an unpleasant topic, we just deny it as a culture. We don't talk about it. We don't engage it. We are a death-denying culture. We, we, we just dress it up, clean it up, sterilize it, and we make sure our hospitals are all very sterile and white because we just don't want to engage it. We just clean it up and put it away, right? Um, and because we deny death, there's a way in which it can sneak up on us because we don't acknowledge that it's coming for someone in a situation where they're getting sicker or older, et cetera. Um, and we can find ourselves in situations where everything seems to be moving so fast, where if we look back in retrospect, really, it, it wasn't. We just, we didn't engage it, that it was coming. And so what happens? What happens when things start moving fast and we realize someone is really uh, sick, sick unto death, or, or just things are moving? And uh, what I've seen happen more times than is, uh, just I've seen happen a lot, is, is that conversation where a doctor will say, what should, we, what should we do? Like asking for guidance from the family because the person who is sick uh, isn't able to speak anymore. And so they ask, what should we do? And they say, should we do everything? And the family says, yes, yes, please, please do everything. And especially if there's any like guilt, like, uh, the didn't come and take care of mama often enough when living far away or whatever whatever it is right if there's any guilt in, in, the, in the family like that that's where it comes out yes we have to do everything we can for for our, our loved one and so doctors do everything they can and nurses try to make it a, a, as clean and, and, and not ugly as possible but if you've been around people who have died Sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes it is really ugly. And we don't talk about it, and so the cycle repeats, and we I end up watching those same conversations. Should we do everything? And yes, please do everything. <sighs> and, you know, and I know that I, I don't, compared to like doctors and nurses and people in, in hospice, uh, the hospice trade, um, I don't see as much death as they do, but I, I do uh, sit with people on a regular basis multiple times a year, and, and that's just... Uh, it's, it can be hard if people don't have it talked through and worked through how to approach death. There is one particular situation that has haunted me for almost, uh, it's getting on towards 20 years now that this has bothered me. Um, there was a situation when I was working as a chaplain at Duke University Medical Center. I was there for 
four or five months uh, working as a chaplain, and there was a lady, she was there in the hospital when I got there. Uh, she had a bad infection, she'd gone septic multiple times, been on the edge of death multiple times. Seps sepsis is when your body is sort of taken over by an infection and infection gets in your blood. And, and when it gets really bad, you, you, you can turn blue, your whole body kind of turns. It's, it's really weird and hard. And uh, she got, she'd get a little bit better and then worse and better and worse. And, and she desperately wanted to get better to go see. She had a, a niece that she had never met that had been born while she was in the hospital, but she had never been able to bring her because she was such an infection hazard. This was someone I had to like put on the full gown and the hat and the gloves to go in and see because the infection risk was very significant. And um, she started to get really bad again and a, a nephew came. And the, the, going down the order of like who is the person to consult, there wasn't, her parents were gone, so it, if the person can't speak, the parents are consulted, and then a spouse, and then like a child, and then it's like the next person in the family. And so the, the nephew was the next person in the family who could speak to what should the doctors do. And the, not, the nephew, who I had not seen at all previously, he shows up, and he starts talking to two doctors. And, and I'm there as the chaplain on the floor, so it's two doctors, the nephew, and me. And the two doctors and the nephew are just talking about uh, all the options they can try, all the drugs, all the antibiotics, all the extreme measures, intubation. Like, they're talking about all these options they can, they can do. And I'm no mind reader, but, like, I'm guessing there was some guilt there because this nephew had just not been there to see uh, his family member at all. And so eventually, like, there came to a pause in the conversation, and I, I chimed in, and I started talking. I have that tendency. I start talking sometimes. I say, you know, I said, that, you know, this lady, I've prayed with her. I've talked to her extensively. She's a disciple of Jesus. She is not afraid of what's on the other side of death. We could consider stopping all these extreme measures. And, and that's what I was trying to say. I don't think I said it anywhere near that cleanly because all three of them like turned and looked at me. And as I tried to get this point out, they looked at me like I had grown a second head right here. Like I'd gone just plumb stupid. Like, they, and they just ignored me. That's obviously crazy talk. And they just went back to all the extreme measures they were gonna use. And that's what happened. This lady, uh, she turned blue. Like sepsis was attacking her body and uh, kept alive with extreme measures. And the nephew never visited again while I was there. Like this has happened two or three months in and the nephew never visited. And I left um, after four or five months that I finished my, my uh, training. I was being trained as a chaplain. I left once I was done with that training and that lady was still there. And I, I don't know to this day what happened with that situation. But what I was left with a sense of that was ugly and we need to do better. We need to do better. And I gotta tell you, my friends, doctors do. Doctors don't do that. Um, there's this guy named Ken Murray, who's a doctor, and he noticed that like in the hospital he worked in, he didn't see doctors on the floor dying. He didn't see do doctors dying in hospitals. Even though that's where most people die, he didn't see that happening. And so he looked into it and he started hearing stories. Um, he were talking to a, a friend here, a story of a, a pancreatic cancer specialist named Charlie. This guy, this doctor named Charlie, had uh, developed the, ca the cancer treatment that had tripled the, uh, the rate of people who survived five years out. Like that's the mark you're looking for when you survive cancer is you want to be uh, cancer free five years out. And he, he had developed the, the treatment that had tripled it from 5% to 15% uh, of people living five years out. But this treatment was amazingly harsh uh, to the quality of life of the person treated. And so this guy who it was a pancreatic cancer specialist developed pancreatic cancer he got that diagnosis and he walked out of the hospital and he never came back. And he, he didn't take chemo or radiation or the treatment that he had developed. He went home, arranged hospice, died at home at peace without pain. And, and that's, what, that's what he chose to do. A Stanford study looked into this and found that 90% of doctors, that's what they're doing. Right? They're declining. When a doctor gets a terminal diagnosis, 
a diagnosis like you're going to die, like this is a terminal diagnosis, 90% of them decline heroic measures. When asked, should we do everything, they say no. And they say no to feeding tubes because once you're on, once you start doing feeding tubes, you can linger for months it, it, unconscious and just linger there, saying no to ventilators because ventilators, they, they push air in, in and out of your lungs and uh, they will keep the exact same rhythm, even if that's not the natural rhythm that your body wants to breathe. And there are times people have to be paralyzed or sedated because they're, they will struggle so hard to rip the tubes out because it is so such a horrifying experience to be forced to breathe at that same rhythm. Uh, they say no to CPR because, like, we see CPR on TV or in the movies. It's not like that. Like, when you do CPR on someone who is elderly, there's an 8% chance that they will be alive in a month. And they'll be alive with broken ribs. Because if you do CPR right, you're going to break ribs. That's how it works, right? The ribs are there to protect the heart and CPR is shoving on the heart. So you're gonna have to break ribs to do CPR correctly. Now, to be clear, I'm talking about doctors with terminal diagnoses. Like this is a, it's a very different thing if a doctor has a car wreck at 30 as opposed to having a cancer diagnosis at 75. Those are different situations. And, and this is, we know this type of logic. Like if I have a, a 2020 Ford F-150 I'll put a new transmission in that. But if I have a 1990 Ford F-150, am I gonna put a new transmission in that? Or I'm gonna say it's served well and it's done. Like the whole system can slows down over time. And whether that system is mechanical or organic is us, right? So why don't we die like doctors? All right, doctors, I'm not talking about Christian doctors. I'm just talking about doctors. Like this is something doctors have figured out. Why don't we get what they have figured out is the wisest way to approach death, right? Even if they're not approaching it from the point of view of faith, this is how they do it. Well, what's happened is how we train doctors has changed significantly. And I can tell you what changed because I experienced it myself when it came to the birth of our children. When Sophia was born, we, went, uh, we were working with a uh, wonderful uh, older Russian lady. Um, fascinating story how she had come to America. And there were some concerns about uh, how, that, how things were going. And we were there with our morning appointment. And uh, she said, here are the things that could happen next year. Option, da, 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 da. here are the options. And OK, so what should we do? And she said, well, go home, come back at 5, and you're going to have a child tonight. OK, great. I mean, it was like, ah, like, oh my Lord, this is happening right now. But that's exactly what we needed in the moment. We needed the wise counsel of someone who understood all the options, explained it to us and said, this is the one that makes sense right, this, right here in this situation. Perfect. It was great. Well, that's easy for me to say. I, didn't, I wasn't the one actually going, going into labor. But it worked out. Second time, we went back. Um, three years later, the older Russian lady had retired. And so we had a... A brand new, like three or four years out of uh, med school or training, and she and she knew what she was doing. She was sharp. She was on the ball. She knew what she was doing. But again, some concerns came up. Different concerns, but some concerns. And, and we got the moment of like, we got to do something. Here are your options. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, what should we do? Well, here are your options. Dun, dun, dun. Well, which one should we do? Well, here are your options. Dun, dun, dun. Which one would you do? Nope, not going to tell you. Here are your options. Dun, dun, dun. And like, I, find myself, I found myself being, I'm not going to say irrationally angry, I'm going to say rationally angry. I found myself being intensely angry because I don't go to a doctor to talk to a mechanic who can tell me what three brands of tires I can put on my truck. I go to a doctor because I need to figure out what is the wise choice, what is the wise course of action in this particular medical situation that has spiraled out of control. Like, because if it hadn't spiraled out of control, I wouldn't be talking to you. But that is part of how our doctors, our, our medical field, the training has changed. And it's changed because of two fears. First, the fear of lawsuits. There's a doctor named Ken Murray who followed the, the, the directive, the advanced directive, the details that a per patient lays out for how they want to die, how they want to handle their death. Do this, don't do this, right? And, and because they did what the patient requested, which was to remove life, excuse me, remove life support, did it with the family, there was a nurse, 
at the host at hospital who disagreed, even though it really wasn't her place to have an opinion, it was a, the, the patient already made clear to the doctor what he wanted. But uh, that nurse reported the doctor for potential homicide. Like, so there's this fear of like, and even if it, like once you've been reported for potential homicide, that's a problem. So there's this fear of like, if they don't handle it exactly right, dot all the I's, cross all the T's, things could get really complicated and ugly fast. And the other fear is around the imposition of, uh, imposition of values, right? If you think about just the, the simple situation, like a Christian doctor and a non-Christian patient, or a non-Christian doctor and a Christian patient, like how, how do you work out that difference in values? And so between the fear of lawsuits and the fear uh, of uh, imposition of values, we find ourselves carrying a higher burden than previously uh, was the case when it comes to directing our own health care. We have to be the ones who are going to proactively direct what will happen. We have to. That is where uh, that is where we are at in a, a culturally, right? We have to learn when to say no. If in good health, if a person's like a car accident in 30 and trying to just get back up and going, yes, life-saving measures. But like, if, if it's later in life and it's a different situation, we are the ones who have to be willing to say, no, this is, this is, these extreme measures do not make sense in light of my faith. They don't make sense, right? So please no heroic measures, no tubes, no CPR, right? Please don't. Because the default is going to be yes. The default is to use every tube, use CPR, use every drug. And if the person is going to die anyways, it can make it really, really ugly. It can make for a really scary and frightening time. Um, and that's the risk. If we don't talk about this and make it clear when we need to say no, then the default is going to say yes. I, I've heard one medical ethicist make the argument that uh, it's a sort of as a thought experiment that we should stop all medical uh, research because we have we've we, as we develop the ability to do no do new things, we haven't developed the ability to know when to not do those new things. And, and we we are so we are the ones who have to learn to say no because others won't be able to do it for us. And so to instead be able to say yes to going home, hospice, family, being at peace, right? And so what we have to do is prepare before the crisis. Be able to talk to our doctors and make it clear. I mean, there's nothing more important in this than being crystal clear with our primary care physicians that what we expect if the, when and if things get bad, right? That if, something, if I am fundamentally healthy, please do CPR. But like if I already have heart problems or other organ issues, is, is, is it, maybe I need to sign a DNR at this point, a do not resuscitate, right? Uh, we we got to sit down with our primary care physicians and, and, and take the time to clarify what we want, what we desire, right? To fill out, uh, an, it's an advanced directive is what it's called, uh, that say, you know, this is, what I want, this is the type of care, to talk about it um, before the heat of the moment, right? right. To, and then to talk to the people who are going to be asked. So if I, um, if I was in the hospital right now and could not speak, first they talk to my, my spouse and then parents and then children. Like that's kind of the order as I understand it. So uh, those are the people who need to know what I expect. Um, what I want, right? So make sure they know, and maybe it's something we need to have direct conversations with people about, or maybe you just need to write it down and give it to them as a letter, because these, these can be challenging discussions, right? Talk about your parents, about how they're gonna die, talk to your kids, like that's, that's a challenge. Maybe you just need to write it down and hand it to them and say, you know what, this is something you need to know, that when it comes time, this is what I want, right? Uh, and to do this now is a very odd gift. But it is a gift, because what it's doing for the people we love is it's removing the pressure for them to make a decision. It removes the uncertainty so that they don't have to potentially risk the guilt of worrying about whether they made the right decision. Right? To start figuring out these things now while we can still talk about them and discuss them. Talk about like what is the level of care that I, I think makes sense for me. And then also to talk about some of the there are monetary parts of this. I mean, money isn't everything, but it is something. And to talk about, um, is it time to make a tr put together a trust, do a will, how do we pay for nursing homes? Like, talk about these things ahead of time instead of uh, waiting till the crisis. And then when the crisis hits, 
Like when we find ourselves having to ask those questions of a doctor sitting down and figuring out what to do for a loved one, hopefully they've made it clear what they want, but if they haven't, just be the person who asks the questions. Will this person survive this? How will this impact a person's last days if we do this? What would you do if it was your mother? And let me tell you, like my mom, my dad, my spouse, whoever it is, like they believe in Jesus. They're not afraid of what's on their side of death. So what is your guidance based upon that value system, right? And then finally, the part, last part of like how we uh, handle these moments, these hard moments is uh, we might need to be the ones who tell people it's okay to go. They may need to hear that. People will linger waiting in bed uh, as they sort of fade. Sometimes they need to hear it. it's, it's okay. We've done everything that needs to be done. We'll be okay. My friends, early Methodists developed a reputation. Before we re developed a reputation for our potlucks and food and all of that, our earliest reputation was around how we died, that we died well. Uh, John Wesley, like he told stories of people who died well in the magazines that were pu uh, published and sent around all the Methodists in, in Britain and then in America. Right? He wrote of a guy named William Green that he died as he lived in the full assurance of faith, praising God with his latest breath. To be there at the bedside of someone who dies and they're not afraid of death, and they have faith and they're looking to the kingdom that is to come. It's not something I want to do, but it is a gift when it happens because it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It happened this last uh, week with a lady named Doris Copenhaver. And uh, she, she told me that uh, she'd been married to her husband for 67 years and it was gonna be good to see him again. And then she closed her eyes. And those are the last words she said to me, right? That was a death that went well, she'd lived a life of faith. She was clear about what she wanted. And in the end, it worked out well. And we were able to celebrate her life and have a great meal together and to laugh and to tell stories. And, and I, I was honored to be part of that. And I would hope that you were able to do that yourself, to live a life of worship and prayer and service now so that we learn, all of us learn to trust and depend upon Jesus now so that when push comes to shove and things get hard, as they do as we approach death, that that faith will carry us through those final days until we do die, to follow the path that Jesus laid out, to follow him in the kingdom that is to come. Thanks be to God.